and we're good to go. Welcome along live on this very grey Monday outside here in Scotland as usual. Hopefully it's a little bit sunnier down where, where our special guest Dave Robertson, aka Reset Robot, is in the house. How are you doing, Dave? Good man, how are you? Yeah, <clears throat> we're good. We're uh, I mean, how's the weather down there, firstly? We are looking at a yeah. Sunny South Sea, mate, and you know it's uh, it's always sunny down here. <laughs> so yeah, it's blue skies and looking quite it's quite fresh, but yeah, it's good. Nice, nice day. I wish we could say the same for uh, Glasgow. Well, to be, right. to be fair though, we've got studio weather. <clears throat> you know that. Well, exactly. That's always a good thing, isn't it? When you when it's grey outside and you uh, go into the studio <laughs> to do a bit of writing, it always feels. Feels quite nice, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you want to move a wee? Yeah, yeah. yeah, um, just, yeah. Split, just split the screen there, so that's we'll split the screen. So get in. There we go. You know what I mean? Need to get myself in. I'm that big. <laughs> Try to get myself in here. Let <laughs> <laughs> all these cables. Um, I man. So do you find like just talking about weather? Do you find that at all helps when you're creating? What like, talking about talking about like the weather? We yeah, the weather. Does it help? Like actual the actual weather the that's mood, going on. Does the mood? So does like, it help um, you create? With regards to mood and stuff like that. Um, I think possibly, yeah, I would be more, I would be more inclined to, you know, settle down in the studio for a full day if it was maybe a bit more of a, you know, not, not a great day outside where I like to get outside, I like to play sports and stuff. So if it's a nice day, I always feel like, you know, I want to get out. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but I, with regards to sort of style and stuff like that, not so much, but definitely with kind of immersing myself in the studio, it's easier if it's a bit grey outside, yeah. Yeah, so it's not thunder and lightning, the dark techno comes out and like... You know. uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so that, it's, it's great to have you on, mate. Um, you know, we do, we do a lot of content like this where we get to speak to, you know, people like yourself and the industry. Um, so I guess like the best way to start really is just ask you... What kind of piqued your interest? What what moment was it, and and kind of when you were growing up or whatever that you thought, you know what, I want to do this. I want to be involved somehow in the scene or uh, DJing or whatever it was. <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, I think probably going back to when I first started going clubbing with my friends, uh, we used to go to a club on the south coast called the Opera House, and there was a night there called Slinky. I don't know if you remember it yeah, as yeah, a. I've heard of that, yeah quite a big trance night but they had all sorts there as well so you could see you know on the same night you might see lee burridge nick warren and then you might have i don't know judge jewels or lisa lashes or someone like that afterwards um or tiesto or someone like that and so it's quite diverse carl cox used to play there pete tong everyone used to play there really um and then there was a good drum and bass night in the in the other room as well which was cool but i remember clearly saying to a couple of friends when we were there i sort of said you know after we'd been going there for a couple of years i sort of said right that i am this is what i want to do i want to do this kind of thing at the time that was me saying that i wanted to do djing and you know they were like yeah whatever it's not, it's not gonna happen dave you'll never do that but actually um what really kind of pushed me into the music industry was learning how to produce my own music but that i think that there was that sort of period of time where we were going to that night where i really sort of realized that's what i wanted to do that's cool and i love that that you know there was something about nights back then that they were just so diverse so we, we had inside out up here in glasgow yeah i'm not sure if yet you managed to go to any inside out nights no but no but it was basically in the arches and, and you had a different style in each room and, and I very much grew up on that as well and I'm like, you know, you could bounce in and see like a house DJ and then yeah. you could judge Jules and uh, Marcel Woods slamming it out and you're like, wow, this is amazing. I've almost carried that through myself as influences, you know, m maybe similar to yourself where you've got that mix mash of just styles, you know, it's not so much, it doesn't so much happen now with club nights, I don't feel, but... No, there's sort of everything so niche now isn't it within you know under that techno umbrella and under that housing it, there's so many little kind of niche sounds that people will go and see you know you, you've got the drum code kind of sound then you've got 
the sort of Ben Clock sort of thing, and then you've got Afterlife, and everyone's got their own sort of thing that they'll have at a night, and it will be that kind of thing that you're going to hear for the whole yeah the whole night. But you're right, it did. I think um, it was nice when you could go to a place and get you know a real mix up of styles. Mm. So you also, you also worked in a, a record store, if, if I'm right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So do you find like that experience also helped curate, like I guess your, your, your sound? sound I like. I don't know if it it, it definitely um, opened my eyes to a lot of other genres mm. that you know at the time I probably wouldn't have found um, because I was you know entering obviously every single record that came in into a system, listening to everything. Yeah. So I was listening to side trance and you know tech house and hard trance and drum and bass it was just everything so um it definitely sort of you know things would come in and you you you'd maybe sort of have a at the time if i was into trance i'd put a tech house thing on that i probably wouldn't normally into and then i'd be kind of like yeah this is actually really really good so yeah i guess it did open my uh mind a little bit to that kind of thing but i don't know whether it sort of pushed me into playing what i played at the time if you know what i mean well you can tell actually that um i think it's one of your tracks is it guitar man is is really got a trancey vibe to it which is cool yeah. you know and again like i know that's where steven really sits he's you know in the middle of of that kind of sound and i find yeah. a lot of the techno's getting a lot trancier right now and melodic and stuff so it's quite cool to hear even a few years ago you were already putting stuff out there even though you're predominantly known as as techno um, yeah so do, do you quite like experimenting with sounds because you've got aliases and stuff so how do you compartmentalize everything that you're working on um that's that is tough actually um i really love those old kind of classic trance sounds so i do try and um, I don't know if I actually try, but that kind of seems to be where I I get a lot of pleasure from using those sort of sounds. Um, but with regards to the aliases and stuff, I normally know quite quickly what I'm working on. If it's going to be, um, you know, a reset. I've got obviously Reset Robot, and then I've been working on some other stuff recently under a different name. I haven't released anything under that name yet, but I know quite quickly what it's going to be when I, when I start writing. Mm, that's cool. And are yeah. you just, are you just trying to gather up some projects before you launch this alias or you're just waiting until you're happy with one or two or. You know what? I think I'm going to have to just start putting some stuff out because I've got so much now. Go for it, man. Yeah. But, but it's not um, dance floor stuff at all. So it's um, kind of in an area that I haven't really released before. Um, and, yeah, I'm I'm a bit sort of worried about getting it out there. Don't and... be, man. Don't be. <laughs> but trust me, just go for it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to have to because it's building up and yeah. building you, up. And same... then every time yeah. I've got a batch of tracks, I think, yeah, that's a good bunch of tracks. <laughs> and then I'll write a few more and then i think oh no those ones are better so i actually it and it's kind of i think i've just got to start at a point get some stuff out there and then start and then yeah and then build from there so do you find like with the lockdown you're producing a bit differently because obviously when it was clubs and stuff you're making music for dance floors mm -hmm. i guess do yeah you think now maybe that's allowing you to go down a different route maybe ambient route or whatever More yeah for I streaming kind of I think everyone's kind of saying they're writing a little bit differently you know so i think there's going to be a lot of music coming out that's sounding really fresh not that there isn't already but i think there's going to be even more so some some amazing stuff coming out but definitely yeah i'm uh finding myself uh writing different styles you know i think it's I quite think it's um good. some of what you're saying there is quite important a lot of the guys that we have one of the biggest issues our clients and stuff face is like not being able to not even if like they have a track per se finished yeah how do you know when it is finished how do you get become confident enough to say 
okay, this is done, I'm ready to send it out. Because this is refreshing, because for guys that are really worried, here's Reset Robot saying it. You know what I mean? And these guys look up to you, you know, totally do. So it's like, how do you get to a point where you're happy and confident enough in yourself to say, I'm quite, I'm ready to show the world this and I'm ready to send it to a label? Um, I think for me, um, I used to release stuff too quickly. And now I would be more inclined to, you know, just sit on the tracks for a little while, listen to them, you know, not all the time, but keep going back to them. And if you still get that feeling of, you know, like, yeah, I still like this and you can sit there, you can listen to it and, you, and you're not going to analyze it too much, then that's when I kind of know that I've written something that I'm still going to like in three, four five, six months, you know, and that's what you want. You want yeah. sort of, you don't want to release something and then six months later be thinking, oh, I really don't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I wish I hadn't put that out. So if you can hold off, you know, just keep going back to it, keep listening. It, it really does make a difference for me anyway. Essentially just like sitting on it for a while because there's something yeah. about when you, when you write a track, there's something about just leaving it alone. Leave it alone. Bad, something changes over time like you know yeah. your perception of it just totally changes so that's good advice i must say though that will change though depending on your experience mm. because like you guys you've got like 10 years and and like years and years of releases so you know the feeling of getting the artwork of signing a contract of putting a big post out and and you know and playing a gig or whatever but for some guys and girls that have maybe never signed they're chomping at the bit they're like oh i need to just get something out there and it's yeah. usually then six months to years later when they've enhanced in their production they're like why have i rushed to that so it is good news so a uh, good advice so it's like try and put that more experienced head on yourself yeah. before you I, I, it's just i guess it's a case of experience and you just yeah. got to keep making tracks and then as you build you get yeah. to that point I just not get too excited sometimes <laughs> yeah. sit on it you'll People always can, think your you tracks know, that's are the best. Di- it's a difficult one to get past because obviously you're naturally if you're producing music and you know you're writing you know ad- quite advanced to intermediate to advanced stuff and you're at a good stage then you're going to feel like you're nearly there so you know i definitely released things too soon and you know, if I look back at some of those old tracks, the production probably wasn't as good as it could have been. But people still love those mm. tracks. And they might be awful for me to hear now, yeah. <laughs> but people did still like them. And then it does kind of give you that, it gets you on that path. So there's a balance to be had, I think. Mm. Yeah, because you can overset on something. Mm. You, I, you definitely can. And that's what I'm in danger of <laughs> now, I think. So. So, so talking obviously about production then, so are you, do you go in with an idea? Do you just get beats flown? Like, you know, if you're going for a typical studio day, how does that look for you when you, you first sit down? Um, yeah, I would just, well, in my studio, um, I've got a couple of drum machines. I've got three, four synthesizers and um, a load of pedals and stuff and what I wanted to have when I set up my studio was that I come in I turn everything on and I've got I can use anything at any point and that's really important for me is that kind of workflow so if I want to send some MIDI notes out to one of the synths I can do that and it works straight away there's no sort of fiddling around with cables and plugging stuff in and out so that's really good for me but yeah I'm quite um probably quite now I would go th- for something more melodic, whereas in the past I would a- always used to start with the drums. Mm. But now I find myself kind of having a fiddle around with, I've got the Moog Matriarch, which is amazing, and, you know, five or ten minutes on that and you've got an idea. Yeah. So I would just get into one of the synths, have a play, and before you know it, you can kind of get something going quite easily. Right. So do you run everything into like a kind of desk then? So you've got everything I've active. I run it all. I've got the Apollo Eight, um, and I just run everything straight into that, and it comes up in the console on the, on the Mac, and and that's it. And then it and then from there it runs into into Reason. Right. So you're, so you're I kind of bypass the desk 
effectively. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So reason then, so have you always used reason? Was that your go-to when you first started and you've just stuck by it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was actually. And I, I think when I first started at music production at college, we were on Cubase. And then someone let me have a copy of Reason. Um, and I took it home, put it on the computer, and that was it. I just didn't look back, really. And um, I still really, really love it. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine changing still now. You know, some people get to a certain point and they, you know, loads of my friends started on Reason, and then they moved on to Logic, and now maybe they're on Ableton. But I've never felt that sort of need to, to change. Why fix it if it's not broke, you know? Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. And the reason uh, always, obviously, like all of these good um, doors, they're always developing and adding new things to keep it interesting. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've used Ableton Live quite a lot because I did my live set um, a, a couple of years back and, you know, really got into it. So I, ha- I do occasionally dip into Ableton Live as well if I'm feeling really stuck that can be another good bit of advice too. If you are feeling really stuck just to have a go at another, another um, piece of software for a bit. Right. That's cool. That's definitely That's, cool. We've got some, because uh, we're live here, Dave, as well, we've got some questions firing. Yeah, through, we've got loads cool. of people coming in. Let's do some shout outs. Um, there might be as well, I think we're streaming on Dave's page as well over at Reset Robot, which is cool. So there may be, um, there may be some questions there. Some shouts out to Harry. Um, who's saying, shout out to Russell Kane, a.k.a. Dave. <laughs> Hope you're keeping well. Love the Audio Tent Masterclass. Can you show us around the studio? Can, 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 can you show us around the studio? I guess he's just talking about take your camera and show us around. Oh, yeah, show us around. Yeah, yeah, Why not? Yeah, so let's this, see. For, for all the studio geeks out there. Thanks, Harry, yeah, for the so question. You can obviously see, what you can see is the, the panels, the acoustic panels that I've got. These are Art Novian panels. So those one ones above uh, you know that's the sort of cloud above Mm -hmm. and then behind the screen I've got some as well and then the bass traps in the corner so I'm using PMC 226 monitors Um, and then I've got some small Genelex here which I use for referencing Um, those are the 8020s I've had those for years actually and they are flipping they kick out a Big sound for the size of them. Um, I've got a turntable and a, a Zone 92 there for listening to my records. Nice. Um, and if I want to do any sampling. And then this is the sort of my favourite bit over here. Uh, so I've got the Moog Sub 37 Korg Minilog, which wow. I don't use that much actually. And then I've got the Matriarch there which is an absolute beast. And then down there is the Korg MS-2000. Nice. Which isn't a classic, but actually I love that synth. It's so good. And then over here, I've got my um, Electron drum machine. So I've got the analog rhythm and then the machine drum. And then behind that, I've got, um, I don't know if you can see there, I've got the two... uh, empirical lab distress distressors which are compressors and distortion nice. and then i've got a lexicon mpx 500 reverb unit and that's it and then i've got a little pedal section here so i've got uh the moog delay the big delay and then i've got this eventide um pitch factor and I've got the cluster flux, which is a chorus flanger thing as well, and then a couple of reverb things and a distortion as well. Those are really good, actually. I love using those, um, and I managed to, with a you know a couple of days' work, get them working through the sends in reason. So um, just some you know in and out stuff going on out of the sound card. But now I can you know turn up a send in reason and it shoots out the um sound to one of these pedals and then kicks it back in again which is really cool because you get some great stuff from those kind of things see if uh, a silly question if you are like marooned on an island what one piece of kit would you have for production if you were only allowed one um it would now be the the matriarch for sure 
just you get so much out of it just hours of fun you know you can put the headphones in and just lose yourself because of the it's semi-modular as well you've got to get a little um, bag of patch cables and you know i don't know what i'm doing with that stuff but just plug them into all the the things and eventually something happens <laughs> make a just, mistake till it sounds good <laughs> exactly yeah just keep plugging them in and out until something good happens basically uh <laughs> there is no rules i guess you no. just gotta yeah, plug in and go i think you know with, with sort of basic synthesis i i know what i'm doing quite well but when it comes to the cv stuff i'm a complete novice so um i think it was good it's a good place for me to start with all of that kind of thing but i can't see myself going much further down the uh modular rabbit hole than that to be honest i can see one of the guys darren saying that he would probably end up single if he had a room like that <laughs> yeah well do you know what's probably good is uh you know i've got a two young children and the studio is above my uh below my son's bedroom so you know once once they hit the sack, that's it. It's uh, studios off. I'm afraid. So that's probably quite a good thing. It's in, you know, it's in the house, and it's um, it's just got. A, when I get to the end of the day, I have to turn it off. Otherwise, I'm constantly back in here listening to what I was doing earlier, and it it gets, uh, you know, what it's like. It's quite addictive, isn't it? Of course. So, in terms of like routine, then, like, do you find yourself sticking to a routine? to get the best results kind of thing like how do you how does a, a typical day for yourself look um yeah I'm, I, I'm quite sort of strict if i'm in here um you know with a, a client doing engineering or co-production then obviously we start we start pretty quite promptly 9 30 and then it's sort of a finish at 4 30 so i like that struck and that has kind of been ingrained into my own studio days now so i quite like that structure to get in nice and early and and start something and then and then just turn it off at the end of the day do you do you do like uh, like particular things in particular days i know some producers they'll say like you know monday tuesday they'll spend writing the the creative part then like the wednesday thursday they'll maybe do the mix down you know the more engineering side like you know kind of structure like that or no i don't i don't tend to do that i mean that's an interesting um way to do it for sure i hadn't really thought about doing that kind of thing but no i'm normally kind of i really mix as i go as well Mm. so once i once i kind of have the arrangement there the mix down's normally roughly there as well so i don't need to spend too much you know i wouldn't go back and then put everything down to zero it's normally sounding pretty okay and then i would just reference on a few other set you know sets of speakers to see if i've uh done a good one or a really bad one <laughs> do you find see when like if you're if you're writing a melody and you've got something quite nice down are you because i know a lot of people get really bugged down on oh it's not the right sound and then they'll spend like two hours going through since and by the time you've went through you've lost you, you've lost what you're trying to do you're frustrated because you can't find anything mm-hmm. people are looking for new vsts to buy and stuff because they think they've not got anything so how do you really move past and go right i've got something nice down i can tweak the sound later but right now it's just time for jamming yeah um if I was really looking for a specific sound, I would find some way of working out how to make that sound. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't like to spend it because you're right; it can really get in the way. Um, so if you if you think it's not quite right, but it's pretty much there, then and it's getting in the way of the creative process. And maybe crack on and just kind of, you know, you know yourself, you're going to change it later, but do the rest of the track or, you know, um, just get on with the arrangement or something like that and then come back to it later. But it can be quite frustrating for sure, especially, you know, personally, I, I don't think I would, I'm not saying I wouldn't have that problem because I can find every sound that I want to find, but it's not that I'm normally, when I'm writing for myself, I'm sort of fiddling around until I find something I like. So I'd be kind of happy with that 
process of getting to something you know i'll just be waiting for something to pop up and then i'll be like oh this is quite cool i'll go with this uh, i get you rather than you. having something in my head that i want to get to if you know what i mean mm-hmm. whereas if i've got someone in the chair with me who's saying right we need to get this sound then i've got to sort of work towards that and get that sound basically so that's when it can become a bit more difficult like what like what do you do if you find yourself like thinking of something and you're not at the studio so like you're sitting somewhere and you're like oh shit i've got a melody going through my head is that a voice note time y- yeah because like it, you know it uh, happens yeah. to me a lot and it's like it's, it's usually when i lie in bed and i can't get to sleep and yeah. then i'm like can i really be asked to get up and open the computer and try and you know and it's like a voice note and then the next day you're like i can't even remember the sound i was trying to make you can't remember up. The thing is with that is I think if you've got an idea like that, you have to get up and try and do it because if you don't, you will never remember it. Even if you leave yourself a voice note, it just sounds awful. <laughs> it does. It does. So I can bum, 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 bum. You're like, that's not what I had. You've got this kind of thing in your head, but you have to sit down at, you know, either using a synth or maybe you've got a drum pattern in your head that you want to get out and you're not going to get it unless you actually go and do it. So I'd always say if you've got that, just get down to the studio in your pants and get, get on with it. Yep, that uh, sounds uh, like what you do, Gal. It does, yeah. uh, uh, that, uh, on a normal <laughs> night anyway. Um, right, we've got some more. We'll, I've we'll, got some we'll, questions we'll, So right. many, so many. I don't want to leave anyone hanging. Uh, somebody mentioned there, I uh, don't know if you remember here, Nino uh, Blank, Nino Blank. Uh, said he booked you for your first gig in Scotland as Reset yeah, Robot. Yeah. 2009. Yeah. 2009. Yeah. Do you have any particular favourite gig in Scotland that you've played or over the years? Like, I mean, Club 69 is a bit of a bit of a place, isn't it? Well, it's an underground champion, <laughs> really. Pretty sure I had a New Year's Eve gig in Glasgow. Um, I it was at um, it was at a place that was attached to a brewery. I'm sure. I don't know if you mm. got no. And it was a it was a pro, it was like um. There was a big function room there, but it was a big room and it was really good um, gig, really busy, but it had to close quite early. And then I went on to um, what's the other famous club in the, the Arches, maybe? The Arches, maybe? Yeah. No, um, sub club? Sub, sub club, potentially. Sub club. Yeah, went there afterwards. Um, but dry yeah, that gate, was dry gate. That was at Chris. Dry Chris Breezy's wrote the dry ah, gate. Right, yeah, okay, I thought okay. it might have been that. Yeah, dry gate. That was awesome. That was really good. Yeah, I mean, New Year up in Scotland, man. You know, it's... <laughs> bonkers. I think there was a lot of energy in that room. It's so nice to play those sort of gigs where the crowd just go go with you. You know, you don't have to worry about too much what you're selecting. You just know it's going to work. Yeah. Do you have a particular favourite place to play? Um, I really loved playing. Used to, I did quite a few of the drum code tobacco dock um, wow. ones. And actually, I used to play the small room, the little gallery. But it was flipping electric in there. It was so good. And everyone, you know, I actually really wanted to play the main room and then I got the chance to play the main room and I didn't like it as much as I liked that other smaller room. Yeah, I think but I think that's uh, that's the nature of the game, isn't it? I think people from the outside would always be like, oh, bigger's always better, but actually okay. intimate settings where you really are having a connection you know because it's like nine times out of ten when you play like somewhere like a big arena, your real fans are at the back. Yeah, you know they can't even afford to get down the front sometimes. You know the real fans are at the back, so when it's a smaller venue, the real fans are right in front of you. Yeah, it was it was such a good such a good room that, and actually it's uh, probably one of the best uh, you know parties production wise I've I've sort of been to I think, and I've been there as a DJ and I you know I've been a couple of times just just to go because it's so good and it's always a brilliant atmosphere. I mean, you you mentioned drum code there. Obviously, like the biggest techno label in the world, um, huge. I mean, obviously they've been developing that sound and are now really dominating. 
Um, yeah. For you, you've worked with some of the biggest names in the game. I mean, like Capriati, Adam Bayer himself, Alan Fitzpatrick. What's it like working with these guys? You know, what is obviously they're normal people like anyone else. What's it like sitting in the studio with them? What's their energy like? Have they got any weird, quirky stuff about them that you're like, that is really weird, but I can understand it because they're a creative <laughs> genius. So, you know, what's that like? Good question. So I've worked with Alan for a long time. We're, we're, we've been good friends for years. So that's just like, you know, probably like you guys sat in a room together, just completely natural. I think when I first worked with Adam, I was probably quite nervous. But um, I think the first track that time I worked with Adam was with Alan and um, it was to help engineer and produce human reason which is a big mm. track from them um so that went that session went quite well and um but yeah i mean they're just they're just normal guys adam's obviously he brings a lot of energy and he likes to get quite hands-on alan's always got a real clear idea of where he wants uh, the music to go which you know for someone in my situation is absolutely brilliant because it just makes my job so much easier mm -hmm. if someone comes in and knows exactly what they want and they're really well prepared um either that means bringing samples or you know that clarity of of where they want to go and uh yeah i mean joe joseph was great to work with too i think you know i've been doing this a long time so i know how to work with people um, and these guys all know their stuff anyway, so it's it's generally quite easy. But yeah, all all really good guys. That's awesome. That's cool. So obviously you can hear that in Alan's tracks, though. That each one's just like you know, it does the job each time. It tells a story, it doesn't it? I, it tells a story. I mean, like that track, we do what we want. That went beyond dance music, I guess. It ended up the TV, didn't it? I, I mean, match, match of the match day, of the day and all that it. we're using it. and <coughs> It was on match of the day. It was on uh, White Lines as well, the, the Netflix right. series. Right. So why? Why? What is it about that track that just had this huge appeal? I mean, it's obviously very, very catchy and stuff, you know? It's so what hook. is it that bridged it over? Oh, it's that hook, isn't it? It's yeah. just that, that hook. I mean, if you ask Alan now to... People ask him to play it out. He just says, of no. <laughs> no. It's like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Play <laughs> under the bridge. And it's like, no. Yeah. Just, no. We've played that a million times. Yeah, so yeah. We've got all this new music we'd like to play. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, that, that track, you just sometimes get them. You can't, I think, unless you're sitting down to write those massive hits and you're just saying, right, we have to write a hit. Um, which actually with that track I don't think well I remember getting to the end of that studio day and I rang Alan and I said oh mate I think I don't think we've had a good day here <laughs> but actually we've had a, a really good day but it's one of those things your ears get tired mm. in the studio during the day and you know you're at the end of the day thinking this is awful <laughs> and then the next day you come in and think actually pretty good it's so strange how that happens. Like you know, it's the ones that you don't mean to write that that end up, you know, being being yeah. massive like that. You know. Yeah, and it's always the ones that you think, man, I think this is the one that never does it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You just never know, and that's actually what with this. Um, I don't know if you saw any of these one for the nerds uh, live Q and A's that I did with Shadow Child. We did one the other week with uh, Nick Hawks and. We were talking about that sending demos out and actually often it's the ones that you're sort of unsure about that really you know prick people's ears up mm -hmm. and that end up being quite big tracks and the ones that like you said you really think yes <laughs> this is it it's not <laughs> it's definitely not so yeah. just actually just to talk a wee bit about collaboration right a big big thing of what we do here is collaborating but also there seems to be especially in dance music a bit of a dirty word when it comes to collaborating or sampling or engineering right mm -hmm. how do you find that you work around that because that you said there that you work you engineer and work with these guys now for me and for you you know we know how the industry works if you look at the top people 
like a Beyonce, for example. They work with millions of people. It's not yeah. like she sits and writes the music and the lyrics. They work with a team, right? And yeah. dance music is no different at times. You know, I think producers are stuck in this rut. Like, if I don't produce every single piece of this myself, I'm yeah. not true to myself. That's not true, you know? So it, how do it, you find the collaborating and find your way around people saying like, oh, you know, you're a ghost producer or you, you know, you well, know I'm just, getting at. If people say that to me, I just point blank say, well, I'm, I'm not. Because to me, a ghost producer is somebody that writes a bunch of, bunch of tracks and then sells them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I could sit here, yeah, I could write 10 techno tracks, but they wouldn't have the same sort of, they'd end up being my tracks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas when when um, someone comes and sits in the studio, there's, you know, they might say, right, put the drum machine on, put a pattern in the drum machine, right, turn that synth on, send some MIDI notes out to that synth, and then they're playing with the synth. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here to make things, make the mix down sound good and, you know, get the session going. And, you know, that that's something that, that um, is important. But all the energy has to come from the person that sat in the studio and the direction of the music has to come from the person that sat in the studio. If I get someone sat in here that's really shy or really quiet, generally it doesn't go very well and, and there won't be a good track at the end of it. If you get someone in here that's got loads of energy, knows exactly what they want, isn't afraid to have a, you know, a play of the synths and the drum machines, it, things just move really quickly. And for, for me, that's no different than, you know, a band having a producer who's right, you know, saying, right, we need to add some keys here. We need to do, we can add these like effects layers and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's no different to that. It's kind of, you know, I pull all the sounds together and make them sound good. I guess it's just because it gets such a bad name because there are those ghost producer types out there that do write the tracks and then they're sold on and then someone else just claims it as their own. I guess that's where yeah, the Muddy Water Yeah, come totally, from. because what you're saying is, is bang on. Absolutely. It's why I wanted to ask you because you're someone in the position of doing it and it usually yeah. comes from people that are like haters or like yeah. a bit jealous or annoyed and they think, well, you know, they could have done that. But it is all about when you're engineering, it's what else does the other person bring to the table? You're so right. Because you come in with ideas and samples and and things like that, so I that's I just wanted to ask that because you're some like really might, the pinnacle of doing that. Some people might bring in, you know, their own drum machine or a synth they've been using. Some people bring it, you know, a three hundred three or whatever, whatever they want to add to their kind of sound. People bring stuff. People bring stuff in, and and the more that somebody does that, the better the music will be. And the more identity it's going to have, more of their own identity mm -hmm, it's going to yeah, have. Yeah, for sure. So uh, just on, obviously on the production note, like one of the major things that, you know, you hear people talk about is try to get that kick and bass. <laughs> it's yeah, like the, the most, old kick and bass. <laughs> it's the most important thing, I, as you know yourself. Have you got any like golden rules or anything you kind of work towards when you're, you're trying to get that to sit? Is there something that, like, you can kind of shine a bit of light on because I know it's for a lot of up-and-coming producers, it's that's, the hardest, that's the hardest area for them to nail, you know? I'm sorry to say I'm still trying to, <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> to sound good and to be the to be, to be be perfect. Um, I've sort of started to think that I'm never going to be happy with that area of my tracks or fully <laughs> so, happy. It's so strange to hear somebody like yourself saying that you know drum code no it's probably good for uh, any up and, up and coming producer to hear that though as well you know it, it's, yeah, it's so important mate it's so important honestly like this is gold man yeah so i still really struggle with that kind of thing and you know i've got 20 tracks on my desktop of my computer now that the bit that's annoying me is the kick and the bass and i will go back mm. and i'll try and change it normally if what I, what I would say is if you get to the end of writing a track and you're sort of feeling like you want to change the kick 
and you want to change the bass, then there's sort of something fundamentally has gone wrong. <laughs> That's with, a good point. Yeah. With it, you know, so you've you've made a mistake earlier on, or you've chosen a bad kick sample, and it's not quite worked. But you know, it's so important because it can swamp the mix, or it can, you know, if you get the right kick and you get the right bass, you get all this nice headroom, and you know, the rest of the track really breathes. If you don't, it can just sound like a muddy mess. Mm. Um, so it's it's a fine line. With regards to, you know, anything that I do all the time to get a good um, sound, I would say it's just the choice of the kick sample or what I'm using. So at the moment, I use the analog written quite a lot. And that's amazing for kick drums. It's just got a good sound off it that's a good wallop even just the 909 samples in there with a bit of overdrive sound brilliant and then a bit of compression in reason sound really good so i've been using that quite a lot recently um and then i've got you know 10 or 15 kicks in my library that i know i can go to that are sort of tried and tested and you know maybe i've used them for myself or with other people but i kind of now i've <clears throat> made a lot of music and played out a lot and heard other people play out a lot i kind of know what's going to work and i'll even now say to somebody might come into the studio and they're like right that kick needs to be louder or it needs more low end and i'm saying it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't need and then they say no i want it to be like this and so i'll end up like pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and then the next day i get the email saying can you turn the kick down please or I'm like, I told you, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, that's why they're you coming know. to you. You know, you know that specifically it's going to be too loud. And stuff like that. Sorry, my uh, WhatsApp thing keeps beeping here. I'm going to turn it off. That's all good. Uh, um, another distraction. <laughs> but, uh, totally, totally. So, yeah, it is important. But, yeah, just getting that, choose your samples wisely, I would say, and just make sure that they're working well from the start. And is it quite a case of like minimal processing on a kick, like you know, not overdoing it? I guess for me, it's always if you get the right sample, then there shouldn't be too much work required. Be too much work, yeah. If you've got to stick, you know, twenty EQ notches in there, it might not be the right. Uh, it might not be the right sound, or um, you know, yeah, it, it kicks can suddenly transform so i like to put a kick in and then try like a tape distortion or something like that and a, and a rubbish kick can actually then become quite good with a distortion on it but then i wouldn't want to have to do that much after something like that a bit of compression and a little bit of eq you know that would be enough for me if i'm like you say if it's getting too much then you kind of know that maybe it's not the right choice. For sure. In terms of compression, that's another dark art, you know, especially when you're up and coming, you're like, compression can be taken in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, when do you typically ap apply compression? Is it to the latter stage of when you're working, so you're not really compressing stuff early on, or how do you typically work yeah. with that? If yeah. you're mixing as you're going, you know? Later on, I would sort of probably do that towards the end. With, the, with stuff like a kick, you know, percussion things that are really going to benefit from a bit, little bit more punch or then I would start laying that on quite early on just to get um, a decent sound going. But with regards to, you know, putting all my, bussing all my synths and then compressing those together, I would, that would definitely come mm -hmm. later. That's, yeah. a, that's interesting. Just, we were obviously talking about like golden rules or things that you would do. Is there anything you would avoid just to flip the question around? Um, so, what, how do you mean? Just any just sort is there, of. Is there any processes, especially for up and comers, like definitely avoid this? You should never put these two things together. Or obviously, right. music's subjective. So, I'm just more like, is there any things that you would usually you just wouldn't stumble into or you wouldn't even bother trying? No, I think I would be more open to, you know, seeing what it sounds like if you put mm. anti reverbs on a kick drum or i don't know just yeah, just yeah, sing, yeah just just mess around and add things on and what i like to do is i like to put effects 
like echo and reverb directly onto a sound rather than in in a send i do use sends as well but i also a lot of the time i will put you know if i've got a, a synth i'll put the echo straight on and then the reverb afterwards and then i'll you know see what it sounds like if i put a distortion on the end of that chain sort of thing just to blow it all up and see what it sounds like i know a lot of people would use their echo and reverb on sends and stuff like that but there aren't any rule there are you know there are some rules but you know just play around and experiment it's the best it's the way that you're going to find things out for yourself i would say and then right so i guess moving on going forward what have you got coming out what sort of stuff's happening in the reset robot camp what can we expect over the next six months to a year this year's <laughs> flew in so you know, 2021 is going to be upon us like that, as we know. So what sort of stuff are you trying to shift your focus onto? And you also do studio work and stuff, which we'll get to later as well. Um, so I, what's the next move? I think for me, it's, you know, I've written a lot of music um, over the past few months. So now really trying to focus on releasing a lot of that. Um, I've got a collaboration with Alan that I've just has just been released on his label, We Are The Brave. And then there was a, a remix on there as well. And then Alan and I both put um, an original track on. So it's a, it's a four-track release, um, two solos, a collab, and then a remix as well. So that's just come out. I've got a release that I'm just getting ready for Whistleblower which is my label that should be ready pretty soon. I'm waiting on a remix um, from a guy called Beridan, who's a sort of a up and coming. He just had something on we are the brave on that hidden treasures um, release, which is like a four track various artists thing. So that's coming out. And then I've got two EPs on true soul ready. And then I've got a track on the next a sides as well on drum code. So wow. finally, I'm sort of getting some of this music that I've been sitting on for ages ready. And actually it's, it's quite nice that I've, like I was saying earlier, sat on it all for a long time and I'm still into it. So I think I'm quite excited about these releases. That's right. So it's going to be a busy year then next year. I think yeah, it's going to be a busy year next year. Obviously, you know, club like club land, that we don't know what's going to be happening there and let's hope that that kind of returns as soon as possible but um, I think while that's not there the important thing is and this is something that came off that call that I had with Shadow Child and Nick Hawks um, if you don't know who he is he set up XL recordings worked at Positiva and set up Incentive as well wow. he's really wow. experienced and he, he sort of said which I took a taken a lot from what he said on that session was about during this time creating momentum so that when we come out of this mm -hmm. you've had a nice steady stream of music and you're still kind of building up you know and you've got stuff coming out rather than just yeah. not doing anything and then having to sort of scramble to get releases out when when all of that comes back you know We've been big advocates of yeah, that. Yeah, I suppose you c it's using the time to create that, you know, backlog of stuff. So whenever yeah. the clubs do open again, then, mm -hmm. you know, the relevance is there, I guess. Yeah, that, but also to be, you know, writing now, but also to be trying to release as well. Yeah. And just releasing all sorts of stuff as well. It might not be like club, you know, heavy yeah. stuff, but, you know, yeah. just... Or if it, if it is and you've got a you know, track, then why not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, 2021 then, so fingers crossed the club scene gets back to some sort of normality. I think the worry is, is like, because it's been such a long period where the clubs have been closed, whether or not there's going to be people there still to run them. Absolutely. Which yeah. is the big, the big kind of question. Uh, so many yeah. jobs are affected, this is the thing, you know, but again, it's hopefully people can try and stay positive and just create as opposed to, you know, just react to the whole situation and just you know, be in a, in a better mind frame to try and just make stuff and, and as you say, put yourself in a nice good footing at the other side of this hopefully exactly yeah creating that sort of um uh you know i guess that word the word would be momentum but 
just create a sort of feeling that you're moving you know you're doing things and you're you're still working towards a goal you yeah. know yeah definitely now we've got a couple of last week questions we'll get to before sure. we wrap up today sure, sure, sure. um and again, just want to thank you so much, Dave, for your time. You know, it's been really great getting to oh, chat could, to you. We could probably chat for a... Could. Yeah, and like, this is the first time we're meeting as well, so yeah. people are seeing yeah. that, you know, we're virtually <laughs> meeting together. Yeah. Um, but there was a couple of decent wee questions there, yeah, just in processes. Just a wee look um, I believe Gary Lamont had asked about um, sampling and, like, out with your hardware, where do you find samples and how do you work with them? Um, so obviously with the hardware that I've got, I would just record stuff straight into reason, but you know, I might do a, uh, a, a five minute take with the matriarch, but I might end up using, you know, a bar of that. So in my, my opinion, that's still sampling. I've sampled synth no different than me getting a sample pack of a synth and using a bar of it, you know, it's just that I might have made that synth line. But I use some, so many sample packs as well. I love using sample packs. I like to do, um, in reason, I, I like to put loops, either synth loops or drum loops, into, a, into the drum machine. And I'll just, like, put a random pattern in, hit play, and then change the start point of... Uh, of the loop and the pitch and kind of see if I can get something different going like that. So, but I, I am not against using sample packs and samples. So I, I find it really helps creatively sometimes. Do you have any like go-to sample packs or does a particular genre you look at? Or do you go outside the kind of comfort zone where you're looking for samples? Um, do you know what? I probably don't do that enough. I've used a lot of, um, the raw loops stuff over the years on my, my friend, Mike, um, runs that, that sample pack company. And I really find those very useful. And more recently I've been using some of the audio tent ones. Um, but you know, I would say anything really, even if you just grab any CD or any album, stick it on, there's going to be something mm. that you're going to find either it's going to be a kick drum or a little two bar little you know half a bar loop or some nice pad somewhere that you can that you can nick and then you can completely transform it and especially if you're then putting it into a completely different genre nobody's ever going to know and it yeah. it can just make things really interesting and so super creative as well you know no one knows how that you've came up with that weird vocal or whatever we've got gary beck coming in is it this week no in 29th year i and what, what he does is he goes to charity shops and buys yeah. vinyl and yeah. just drops the needle while his track's playing and just dro randomly dropping the needle on just these random records, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, See oh, what fits in, maybe? Yeah, what's that? That's strange that works. It's yeah. awesome, yeah. I mean, and his stuff works so <laughs> well. It's great. It's so quirky. How many times have I played um, his tracks over the years? So many. So you just wonder, like, obviously, where he gets those kind of cool vocals and bits and, like, you know, like, wow, where the, how did they discover that? And it's just... Well, he, you know, it, it, he's he's kind of doing it in a more interesting way than just going through vocal loops in a sample pack, mm. which can work sometimes as well. But, you know, he's going to get that more original, interesting sound by doing it like that. Just spending a bit of time going through it and and giving yourself that little bit of time to do that um could just you know it can make make a really interesting part of the track yeah you were talking about using reason he still uses acid pro yeah and um, he's still in, Again, in those uh, days if, if it's not broke then you don't need you don't need to touch it if you've got a system down then that's it he's and he's made some absolute bombs isn't he yeah exactly sure. Um, there was one here from one of the guys saying, do you ever check remixes or edits or bootlegs of reworks of your own music? Um, some people have sent stuff. Someone sent something fairly recently, actually, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> um, I, You know, people do that, and I've done that to other tracks as well. You know, I've re-edited tracks or reworked tracks, um, but I would normally just do it for my... DJ sets, you know, mm -hmm. um, but 
yeah, I would I would be kind of interested to have a listen if any, anyone sent anything like that. Is that what he means? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. yeah. And um, probably want it to wrap up on, which is what we usually ask most guests that come on. It's a moment for you to like school us or educate us on any artists that you're digging or sets, or if you can put us on to someone that maybe we've never heard that we should listen to? Um, that is a very good question. What am I listening to at the moment? Do you know what? I am sort of, I've got a really full, loads of stuff in my cart on uh, Beatport at the moment, but I haven't bought anything for ages. But I've been listening more to... Um, People like Fortet, mm. I really, really love uh, his music and, yeah, kind of could listen to that kind of thing all day, really. But that's more the sort of thing I've been listening to recently. Yeah. So mm. Fortet and Caribou and people like mm. that. Yeah, nice stuff. N- definitely nice stuff. Like, do you find sometimes not listening to dance music helps you as well? Like listening to other genres? Yeah, yeah, listening to other genres and... Um, I listen to actually listen to six music loads and I always there's always something on there that I have to go right I'll go on to you know Spotify or mm-hmm. Apple Music and find the artist and then listen to the album and stuff like that so there's another um, who was it that I've been listening to recently <laughs> these, this, these guys The Colours That Rise right mm. this is a wicked album absolutely brilliant the colors that rise need to check that out uh, we'll, we'll be putting that on once we get off the call <laughs> it's quite sort of um you know again it's not dance floor stuff but it's uh got a great vibe cool yeah so Sounds yeah good in your stuff eh? awesome yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Dave, Aye, man, that, that's, thanks, that's man. Been a, that's been a fast hour, mate. Thanks, right, guys. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. No, it's been a total pleasure. Uh, just, you know, just get a general kind of geeky production music chat with you, mate. Um, yeah. Total pleasure. So, and it was a well, while hope, in the making, so some... I'm glad we've made it happen. And hopefully we can do some more stuff. You know, it'll be lovely to catch up again, man. Definitely, um, you know, your music and that's brilliant. And I'm excited for the future for you, mate. Hopefully these things take back up again with the world being mental and we'll we'll yeah. be back playing the tobacco dock soon and <laughs> we'll be not nice, totally mate totally Absolutely. you've just got to stay positive cool yeah all right guys well nice fun, mate. chat i'll speak to you soon thanks. yeah thanks again thank, mate. thank nice you fun. very much catch you soon bye bye right excellent okay. excellent and we are Done. Done. How amazing was that? That was good, eh? That was class. He's a legend. Okay, aye, aye. Down to earth, spot on, knowledgeable. Uh-huh. I mean, he's one of the, the greats of the scene, isn't he? He genuinely he's... is, but I love how humble he is about aye, it. He's, he's super cool. You always find these guys, when you speak to them, they are super humble, aren't they? Yeah, and I think as well that um, for a lot of the members and people that are making music and stuff, I think they have this illusion that you need to know absolutely everything. Yeah. And you don't, man. Yeah. You don't. You know, it's a, it's like it's like, there's someone as humble as Reset Robot. I mean, it literally produces with some of the biggest in the game talking about he's not happy with his kicks and bass. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but again, uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Random one on a Monday as well, 12 to 1. Um, we managed to get that to happen, so pretty happy with Aye. that. Kicks a week off nicely. Totally. Always like to try and be a wee bit different. So thanks again to Dave, a.k.a. Reset Robot, for another great Bro, episode. What a legend he was. What a legend, man. Bro, we'll his... be back tomorrow for our members. We will be, aye. Do the member session tomorrow yep. night. If you're interested in the members' uh, stuff, we will do all of that kind of thing, you know, where you know, doing production. Yep. Um, all sorts of stuff. Give us a shout. Absolutely. And but, we'll man, that was wonderful, man. Right. Happy Monday, troops. Till next time.